Testing, one, two, three, testing.
morning, please. It's time to stand up as you're able for the opening praise song. way to start a service. Marshall and Janet, thank you. Elena, welcome back from Russia. She's been gone for the last couple weeks um, seeing family, so we are happy to have the team back together. I'm Jane Rideout, though, one of the co-lead pastors here at St. Andrews, along with my husband Gary, who will bring the scripture. 
For those of you online, we're so happy you're joining us this Sunday as well. And so as you can see, something's different today. Today's the, um, starting tomorrow will be Vacation Bible School. It will even be better than this because we got a backdrop that will go up and the, um, the waterfall will cascade down the steps. So we're very excited. We are ready. We're ready for the 200 kids who will join us and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the most important thing. In addition to that, there'll be somewhere between 50 and 100 additional people who will be keeping all the kids safe and making it possible for them all to be here. And we always pray that that's transformative too. And I believe it is. When you serve, you are changed. You are absolutely changed. So it's going to be a great week. So we have the One Blood Mobile out in the parking lot, which means that after the service today, you can um, go out there and give blood. You can bless others who um, you'll never meet, but we do so. We are compelled because Jesus says to love our neighbor, and that's how we love our neighbor. We share our blood, and so that's so important. And that, that opportunity, be, well, they're there for you today. They're there till 1.30. All right, and then the last announcement. So after every Vacation Bible School, we have Celebration Sunday. There were years when we called it Christmas in July. We now call it Mission Sunday, and we will be highlighting the last three mission trips this summer. I got home late last night from a mission trip, and so it will we'll highlight all three for you, which all were amazing and wonderful. And we will be having a party in the in the courtyard. Now, what's different for this service is that if you want to be a part of that courtyard party, you're going to have to come early because it runs from 9 to 1130. There's a raffle and everything if you visit all the mission tables. So if you would like to be a part of that, come early next week and um, enjoy that before you come into worship. And then we will have these. This is what we're going to be collecting next week. So you got one of these when you came in. These are the 10 ministries that we support at St. Andrews. And there's different options of ways that you can bless a couple of these if you choose to. And so you will be able to do that. You can still bring your stuff in at 11, 15, and that's okay. If you don't come early and you can't drop it off at the table out there, bring it in here and we'll make sure they get that. But that is next Sunday. This is an important day in the life of the ministry and we get to remember all the great ministries of St. Andrews. And here's the deal. This is not even a complete list. There's more on here that are not listed that we do. That's the kind of church that St. Andrews is. All right. I think that's all the announcements. So now that you're all comfortable and relaxed, let's get up. You know what? No. Did I get something wrong here? How about we have a hymn sing first? Oh, that's right. There We're going to we go. sing some songs. So Janet, no, she's, take... No. She's going to pick. I will sit. Okay. How about that? It's okay. She's all right. She's great. Okay. All right. We're going to ready to pick some hymns. We can pick, uh, we'll do four today, and then we'll see what anybody online has one. So raise your hand if you have a song, especially if you didn't pick last week. And Janet, yes, can you explain why, why we're doing it this way, Janet? The hymn sing? We do the hymn in sing month in of July, July because it's we don't have a choir, so we do a hymn sing instead. And this is your chance to get those hymns you haven't heard and, and ask for them and get them sung. Back in the back. 364. Well, that sounds familiar. I should know what it is. Okay. Yes, 369. Yes. In the garden. We couldn't do a hymn sing without in the garden. Yes. We did that earlier. That's good. We'll do two verses of that. So, okay, that's it for right now. Unless somebody online says something. And I'll be ready because for two more weeks we're going to have it. So you have a chance if you didn't get your hymn today. Okay, now you may get up and greet each other.
Good morning. The Spirit of the Lord is, there is one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. Please join me in the creed. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power and love, whose mercy is over all his works and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and a promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. Last night, after the assassination attempt of the former president, our bishop, Bishop Berlin, sent out a, um, a communication to us all. And in it, he quotes Willis Tate, who was the president of Southern Methodist University, at a convocation service in November 26 of 1963, following the murder of President um, John F. Kennedy. And when he was talking, he was talking about the response of the church to violence. And this is what he said. Wherever there is a sin and injustice, the church must call us to repentance. Whenever there is hatred and fear and suspicion, the church must call us to repentance and reconciliation. Wherever there is a, a liturgy lethargy, excuse me, and disloyalty through inaction to our noble faith. The church must call us to repentance and action. Violence towards any, any candidate is repugnant. And as people of faith, we don't support that. So today, we're going to reflect just for a moment, and then we are going to lift up any elected, um, any elected official for their safety and protection we are going to lift up the um, secret service and the police force that surround them who put their lives in harm's way for us we will lift up the victims and then we'll pray for our country because we are divided and we need god to soften our hearts so as we go into this election year that we are not seeing 
political rivals, but instead we are seeing the face of Christ in every human being. So let's begin with a time of silent prayer and then we will pray together. Loving God, we ask that you will forgive us. Forgive us for those spaces when we have cold hearts, when we feel angry at other people because they don't agree with our thoughts. Forgive us, Father, and help us to remember that each one of us is a creation of you and that we are called to love our brothers and sisters. Loving God, we lift up the victims from last night. And we ask that you will surround the families and those who are in the hospital, that you will bring them full healing. And for all the emotional hurt that is around them in their lives, moments that they will now never forget, we ask that you will bring healing and that you will also heal their minds. Loving God, we lift up um, the former president. We lift up our present president. We lift up all the elected officials and we ask for your safety and protection around all of them keep them safe they serve us help us to be protectors of them father god we lift up the secret service and the police force that on a daily basis put down their lives for us and we ask that you will surround them bless them in their service and keep them safe and for our country, heal us, Father. We have such a deep schism among us. Help us to set aside not our beliefs, but our anger and our frustration. Allow us to be people who think differently and don't necessarily agree, but still love. We thank you, Father God, that it is possible because the Holy Spirit resides within us, that we can do the things that we didn't think we could do because of the Holy Spirit that makes a way within our hearts and in our minds. Help us be attuned to his nudges. Help us to listen in the direction he pushes us forward and help us always to bear the face of Christ to all the world. And now together we pray the words by one spirit that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we go into a time where we give you an opportunity to give your tithes and your offerings, we always focus on a ministry here at the church. And today we're focusing on Family Promise. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful uh, ministry that really does good work in our community. We um, open up our church one week about every two months for uh, people on the verge of being homeless to stay here at the church and to stay in our classrooms and uh, to, so that they won't go be out on the street. We're in association with other churches, but it takes a lot of volunteers to do that. And uh, we just had, uh, two or three weeks ago, we, had, we hosted a week, and it was just fantastic, of all the people that came through and helped out and volunteered and gave money and cooked and everything, and we just wanted to thank them uh, all of them for, for what they do in the, for Family Promise. Because of that, there were two families that week that might otherwise didn't have a place to stay, but we let it, we opened our church, two large families uh, that had a place to stay here at our church. So that just wanted to let you know uh, what kind of ministries we have here and what you're giving support. Uh, so during the next song, special song, um, solo, uh, we're in, those who are in the sanctuary, 
there's baskets in the front, there's baskets in the back to give your offering, and there's other ways to give, as you can see on the screen, you can even give online. So thank you for your generosity, and we certainly appreciate it. stand for our doxology.
Please bow your heads. Gracious God, in this sacred moment of offering, we recognize your sovereignty and mercy. As we present our gifts, may they reflect our gratitude for your presence in our lives amid the complexities and uncertainties of our journeys. Guide us to dance with abandon, even amid our doubts and struggles, trusting in your steadfast love and grace. Amen. Please. Before I get started on uh, Mary Magdalene, I want to tell you a story. This is a true story. When I lived in Dallas, I had a couple of friends there, Greg and Mandy, and they were in a serious dating relationship. But as many relationships do, they sort of drifted apart and they broke up. But you know, the, the situation where the problem is they have mutual friends, I was one of them. So it was a big a bit awkward every time we were in the social settings. But they were very civil with each other and they dealt with it. But at one point, they both attended the wedding for a couple of our friends. However, Greg brought a date. Mandy did not. So you know where this is going. So this is the first time that they were in the presence with each other when one of them had a date. But Mandy was determined, I'm going to take the high road here, and I'm going to walk right up to him and be nice to Greg and his date. And she did. She walked right up to him. I was standing there, so I got an eyewitness view of the whole incident. But Greg ignored Mandy. I don't know why. Maybe he was just awkward. He wouldn't even look at her. And I could tell this was getting to Mandy. She was getting angry. I saw her lips start quivering. I saw the, the, the uh, blood started boiling up, beat red up, up, up in her head and face. And I said, uh-oh, something's about to happen here. And it did. Suddenly she couldn't contain herself anymore. And she threw her drink in Greg's face. She stormed out of the reception. Later on, I caught up with her and was talking to her, and she, she was just devastated. She said, I can't believe that. I'm extremely embarrassed. I can't believe I did that. It was an impulsive move, and emotions got the best of her just for a split second. But she did decide, well, you know, I need to, uh, I need to, uh, things aren't going right for me, not very well here in Dallas, so I'm going to move on. And she uh, moved to South Florida to be near her family. She got a job at a pro shop at a golf course, and she was starting a new life. It was a few years later down the road. She was working at that golf course when she saw this guy named Mark walk into the store. Mark was one of Greg's good friends back in Dallas, and she panicked. She, she ducked behind the counter. One of her coworkers said, what are you doing? And she told her the drink in the face story. Her coworker said, come on. Um, that was a long time ago. That was back in Texas, thousands of miles away. He's not going to remember that. She said, okay, you're right. So she stood up behind the counter. Mark walked to the counter. And Manny said, hey, do you remember me? 
Mark kind of looked at her a second, and the, the, you see the light bulb go on. Yeah, you're the girl that threw the drink in Greg's face. Sometimes your reputation precedes you. How often does your past deeds follow you around and people won't let you forget them? You feel that it's hard to shake the ghost of your past. During the month of July, we're looking at four different women who are very ordinary in every way, but because they decided to trust, put their trust in God, they were extraordinary things through them. We call these sheroes. Our shero today is the story of such a person in the Bible, Mary Magdalene. She had to shake many ghosts in her past, some that bordered on rumor and gossip, but she still had to deal with them in her life and down through Christian history. And she was an honorable woman, surrounded by whispers about her past. Yet the perseverance and dedication to God's call in her life, in spite of all these rumors, is a lesson of faith we all can admire and we all can live out, even us men. She's an example of how your past things that seem to trail you throughout your life, whether true or fabricated, you can live through them, get through them. Now, Mary Magdalene is mentioned 12 times in the, in the Gospels, more than most of the disciples. She's introduced to us in the scripture lesson for this morning in Luke chapter 8, verse 1 to 2. Soon afterward, Jesus traveled to the cities and villages, preaching and proclaiming the good news of God's kingdom. The 12 were with him, along with some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Among them were Mary Magdalene, from whom seven demons had been thrown out. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Okay, now it gets confusing because there are multiple Marys in the gospel, in the New Testament. And sometimes it's difficult to discern which Mary is being talked about or referred to when Scripture mentions a certain Mary. Mary was the most common name for a Jewish female back then. There are between five and nine prominent Marys in the New Testament, depending on how you sort them out. Some will say, well, these two Marys are the same person. These two Marys are not. These two, three. So it depends on how you sort them out. So when writing about her, it's necessary to clarify which Mary you're talking about. Mary Magdalene was easy to sort out because she was always called Mary Magdalene, Mary uh, from Magdala, uh, Magdalene. But she can be confused with some of the other Marys in the gospel. So let's look at the Marys and let's try to sort them out. Get your scorecard ready, okay? Here we go. The list of Marys in the New Testament. Well, the, the, uh, the easiest one is the Virgin Mary, the mother of Christ, the one who gave birth to the Lord uh, Jesus. He's descend she was a descendant of King David. She was married to Joseph. That's one of the Marys. Another Mary is the Mary of uh, the mother of James and Joseph. She was an eyewitness to the crucifixion. So we read in Matthew 27 about the description of what's going on during the crucifixion. We see many women were watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to serve him. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Je Zebedee's son. So there's one Mary there. Here's another Mary. Mary, mother of Clopas. Jesus, this is the Gospel of John version of the crucifixion. Jesus' mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene stood near the cross. Okay, so the Matthew version says, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. The John version says, Mary, the wife of Clopas, who happens to be Mary's sister. So, scratch my head, say, how can Mary have a sister named Mary? But that's what it says. So can you research that for me, Gabe? Why? Okay. But um, so it could be that maybe somebody got, put the wrong name down. It really was uh, a different Mary. So the third one here we're talking about, the next one I mean, is Mary of Bethany. So she's one of the sisters of Lazarus who Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And you probably remember this story about Mary and Martha and in the New Testament where Jesus comes to the dinner party and uh, uh, Mary's sitting at the feet of, of Jesus and listening to him. And Martha's the one that was filling up the drinks and filling up the, uh, making sure everyone had ice cubes and enough potato chips. And, and Martha was, in, you know, uh, it was uh, upset at her sister Mary. That's that Mary, the mother, um, yeah, Mary of Bethany. But she's also uh, was the one talked about in John 12, 3, the one who washed Jesus' feet with her hair and with some perfume. We read that in John 12. 
that Mary took an extraordinary amount, almost three quarters of a pound of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She anointed Jesus' feet with it, then wiped his feet dry with her hair. So th that's identified as Mary of Bethany too. Now, the story goes that this, this Mary who washed his feet with her hair eh, was a prostitute, a woman of ill repute. So, um, so this, this comes into play later in my sermon. Now, the next one is the Mary, mother of John Mark. And we read in Acts 12, realizing this, he, Peter, made his way to Mary's house. Mary was John's mother. He was also known as Mark, Mark the writer of the gospel. So Mark the writer of the gospel's mother was also Mary. You following me now, getting them all straight? And then there's the Mary of Rome. Paul mentions her briefly in Romans 16:6. 6, Greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. Uh, she's a, a faithfully served the Roman church. Now, some people say, well, it's probably maybe one of the other Marys. Well, no, this is a Mary that was in Rome. These other Marys were in Marys in Jerusalem and around that area. So this was a different Mary. So then there's Mary Magdalene. So this is the one we're coming to today. Mary was a Jewish woman from the fishing town of Magdala on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. Magdala in Hebrew means tower. She's, that's why she's often sometimes called Tower, uh, Mary Magdalene. She's a remarkable character in Christianity because we know that she was at Je present at Jesus' crucifixion and his resurrection. In fact, according to Scripture, she was the first to see the risen Christ, Mary Magdalene. At the crucifixion, the Gospel writer Matthew paints a picture by writing in his narrative, and this shows that she was at the crucifixion. Many women were watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to serve him. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mother, Mary the Mary of Jones and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. So she was, at the, she was at the crucifixion. In fact, if you go through the different four versions of the, of the gospel about the crucifixion, the resurrection story, they're sometimes a little bit different, but all four says that Mary Magdalene witnessed his crucifixion and his burial. They all four attest to that. Her connection to Jesus was undeniable. So, continuing on, we read in Gospel of John, chapter 20, the events of the first Easter morning. Early in the morning of the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came, in the, came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. At this point, she's really still not, she's not quite grasping that Jesus had been risen. All she knew was the body's gone. So that Jesus was not in the tomb. In verse 2, we read, She went running to Simon Peter and John and said, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Later on in chapter 20 of John, we see Mary Magdalene. She's back at the tomb now, crying. As she was weeping, she heard a voice behind her saying, Woman, why are you crying? In her grief, she was kind of foggy-eyed. She thought, this, this is the gardener talking to her. Mary Magdalene asked, Where have you taken him? Jesus then calls her by name, Mary. Hearing, hearing her name being called in a familiar voice, she looks at him directly and recognizes that that is Jesus. And she embraces him. And Jesus says to her to not, to not hold on to him, but to go and tell the others. So she left. Mary Magdalene left and announced to the disciples, I've seen the Lord. Not only was she the first one to see the resurrected Christ, but she was the first to tell others about the resurrected Christ. So she was the first evangelist of the resurrection. And that's a significant role in the life of the, the story of Jesus, the life of the, the church in our Christian history. Mary Magdalene was not a bit player in this whole thing. She was one of the main characters, as much as the disciples were. Most of what we know that happened on Good Friday between noon until he was buried, we know because of Mary Magdalene, because she was there. She was there. And this is kind of embarrassing to men because they say, well, the Mary Magdalene, the women were all there. Where were the men? They had bolted. <laughs> they were all gone. They had left. The women were there. Now, Mary Magdalene was a stalwart tower of faith and devoted to Jesus. But down through history, there have been a kind of a mystery and rumors about her. For one, as we read in the scripture, we read in the scripture lesson that seven demons had been thrown out of her 
apparently by Jesus himself. That is all we read of this. What does this mean? What kind of demons were they? In our modern world, it's hard for us to grip, come to grips with demon possession. Now, but we want to realize in the days of Jesus, they did not have the medical or scientific knowledge that we do today. Someone with certain mental or physical ailments would be categorized as being demon possessed. Now, I'm not discounting that demon possession doesn't exist, but uh, mental illnesses, anxiety, phobias, severe depression, epilepsy even, could be looked at as demon possession. But for Mary Magdalene, there are no details. One can only speculate what this was. But what we do know is that Jesus healed her of these demons. Yet she probably lived the rest of her life labeled and demeaned as, the, here's that woman that had seven demons in her. Whispers are probably rampant behind her back. Interestingly, and like most other women in the Bible, Mary Magdalene is not identified in relation to another person. She is not anyone's mother, wife, or sister. Interestingly, instead she's just called Mary of Magdala, which is probably the title that includes she was very prominent in the city. Maybe she's very, uh, she, had, she was well off, and an independent woman, well off financially, that, that helped support Jesus' ministry. Because no family is mentioned in scripture, um, for her throughout the century, she's kind of got a, a bum rap. She has been identified as being that prostitute that we mentioned in Luke chapter 7, the one who washed Jesus uh, uh, with her hair and her perfume. She, she began to, you know, wet, it says here, she began to wet his feet with her tears, wipe them with her hair, and then pour the perfume on her feet. Because this woman is not named, people have speculate, who was this woman? Well, in 591, September 14th to be exact, Pope Gregory the Great gave a homily in Rome that pronounced that Mary Magdalene was that unnamed sinner in that story, and that she and Mary of Bethany were indeed the same person. So Mary Magdalene gets this typecast. She's the perfume lady, and you know that lady in the story? She was a prostitute, so Mary Magdalene was a prostitute, a person of ill repute. I have to say here there is no evidence that Mary Magdalene was the prostitute mentioned in Luke chapter 7 who wept at the feet of Jesus. It's a wonderful story of forgiveness in the Gospels, but it's not Mary Magdalene. And reducing one of the most important leaders of the early church to a prostitute has been a disservice, especially for women, by feeding in the notion that women are either good girls or they're bad girls, prostitutes, especially those who weren't married. Women played a powerful role in the leadership of the early church, women especially like Mary Magdalene. So what can we learn from, uh, let's, as we conclude here, what can we learn, men and women, from the faithful life of Mary Magdalene? So here we go. First of all, be driven to gratitude. We know that Jesus healed her from seven demons. She was a changed person after that and eternally grateful. Her gratitude was lived out by the devotion to, to Jesus. Everything she did after that was her passion for Christ because of the gratitude of what Christ had done for her. It's what kept her loyal to the Lord and serving him until the end. Two, don't be shackled by your past. In Christ, we are not trapped by the past. No matter what happened in the past, Jesus can free you to live an unburdened life and to not be defined by the person you were or the person who people think you were. Your past doesn't matter when you're in Christ. Three, there's always hope even during the grim times. Mary Magdalene was present there at the crucifixion. And I'm sure that as she walked away from, uh, after they took him down from the cross that day, her spirits were devastated. She saw them lay Jesus in the tomb with the large rock covering their entrance. She felt, that's it, that's final, it's sealed. He sealed away. And I can imagine there are many of you in here now that there's something going on in your life and now there's, you're in the midst of a grim situation. But you've got to remember Mary Magdalene. On that first Easter Sunday, a new day dawned for her. The tomb was empty. Jesus was alive. And there'll be the dawning of a new day for you as well in the midst of your despair in your life. Four, Jesus calls us by name. 
Remember that Mary Magdalene did not know that Jesus was alive when she went there that first Easter Sunday to the tomb, that he had been resurrected. Until what? Until Jesus called her by name. All of her despair, all of her doubts melted away. We have to know that Jesus is calling us by name too. Calling your name to trust in him and to live the abundant and eternal life that he offers to all of us. And fifth, lastly, don't keep the message of Christ to yourself. The first thing Mary Magdalene did when she encountered the risen Christ is that she announced to the others, I've seen the Lord. I've seen him. When you have encountered the Lord in a special way in your life, in any way, don't keep it to yourself. Let them know what Christ has done in your life. Let others know so that they too will desire life in Christ as well. Mary Magdalene lived out these words in Colossians. So live in Christ Jesus the Lord in the same way as you received him. Be rooted and built up in him. Be established in faith and overflow with thanksgiving just as you were taught. We give thanks to the life and example of faith and devotion that we find in one of the towers of the early church, Mary Magdalene. May we live as she did in her desperate longing to be close to Christ and serve in a way, every way that she could. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Three sixty nine. Ah, blessed assurance. I am the Lord of the 
a benediction. Um, if you are one of the folks who received an email this week that said that you need a picture for the directory, I'm taking pictures right after the service and meet me in the lobby and we'll get that picture done. If you are on live stream and you have not submitted to the directory, we want you to be in the directory. That's it. We have a place where you mark off what service you attend and we have a place there for people who are only online. So please do not hesitate, all of you. We want everybody in the directory, whether you are a member or not. Gary. It's been a wonderful morning of worship the whole morning. Now, you don't want to tell you that you don't know this, but we had four baptisms this morning. Two of them were teenagers giving their first time commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's a very exciting day for us. And tomorrow's got a lot of fun. Got to start with a vacation Bible school. Don't forget that the uh, blood mobile is out there for those who want to partake, use, uh, do that and uh, donate your blood. Uh, so now I've received this benediction. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knives of love of God and of the Son, Jesus Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessings of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.